Hey, Brad. Yes. What's your favorite Linux distro? Look, man, we have made it 18 episodes into this podcast. Are you sure you want to do this? There are at least three different distros running in my house right now. Okay. All right. right, Let's start there. Maybe four. What do you got? I got uh, a Pi-hole that runs Raspbian based on Debian. I've got a small server that runs Ubuntu. Okay. I've got a Steam Deck that runs Arch. Sure. That might be the last one. Okay. I've got... um, Oh, Home Assistant. Okay. What does Home Assistant run on? Which I don't remember. I don't remember what the base of that is. Okay. Um, I've, let's see. I've got a lot of Debian around here. I've got a, a bunch of Ubuntu containers. I've got one Arch container. I had a Fedora container for a little while that I have retired for the moment. There's a lot of options out there. Yeah. yeah. So what's your favorite, Brad? Um, I like, I'm not just saying this because of our guest. I genuinely enjoy Debian quite a bit for a lot of reasons. I think I've had the most fun with Arch. Okay. But fun? That's because it's for gaming. Fun is one word you could apply to Arch, sure. It's, it's on a device that I use exclusively for gaming. Uh-huh. Not mission critical, you're saying. But Debian was the first time I used Linux that it became something I could, I like, I learned to use Linux with Debian. I like, there's, we'll talk about it in a, in a minute, but th- it was the first one that was accessible and approachable and usable on the day to day. And that, if you made a management mistake, you didn't have to just nuke and pave the entire machine and start over, which was remarkable back in 2002 or 2003, whenever I was running Linux on the daily. Well, hey, you know what they say about Linux? No. It's only free if your time is worth. Oh, no. <laughs> Welcome to the FOSPOD. I'm Will. I'm Brad. Brad, this week's episode of the FOSPOD is brought to you by Google Open Source. They bring all the value of open source to Google and all the resources of Google to open source. You can find out more at opensource.google. Sure can. Brad, this week our guest is Jonathan Carter, the project lead of Debian. He sure is. Which is one of the oldest and most influential Linux distributions. I'd agree with that. Yeah, absolutely. I, dude, I'm excited about this episode. I... I'm an enthusiastic Debian user myself, and we've been talking, gosh, since probably before this podcast even debuted about getting a rep of a major distro, right? Like that's kind of, if you're yeah. going to sit down and do an end user oriented open source podcast, who are you going to talk to? Somebody that runs one of the major distros. Like that's right there at the top of the list. And I think Debian was the right choice for this. Well, yeah, Debian, we, we talked about it a little bit in the interview, but for folks who don't know, Debian was the first, at least the first Linux distro that I knew about, I think it was probably the first, that introduced the idea of software as packages that included like all the things that like those those packages contain not just the software itself, but also a list of all the things that the software needed to run so that when you needed to install something, you could just grab the, the packages that you needed and type a command, you know, uh, package install and then the package name. And that was all you needed to do. Now, They took that idea and then built on it and added the apt system, which is, I think, advanced package tool, I think. I believe apt stands for advanced package tool. Yeah. Which is their package manager. What they did was they made a database with a list of all of the officially supported packages. And they also made that a form, a spec that you could host your own repos, is what those are called, repositories with your own packages in them. If you, if you like made back ports from other distros or different versions or closed source versions of drivers or stuff like that, you could put them in, a, in an apt repo. And then all you have to do is add that repo to your repos list and type apt install and then the repo name and it would Debian would reach out to the internet, grab the files for the software you want to install and everything that that software needed to run, which just to be clear, prior to this living hell, like it was really hard. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm barely speaking from experience because the little I dabbled with it just made me turn tail and run away. But yeah, like prior to that, you were basically downloading source code and compiling it yourself and installing it yourself. And you had to deal with all those dependencies yourself and package management made all of that not dead simple, but pretty close. Well, you could get into a thing that people call dependency hell, where like you had three pieces of software you used. They needed three different versions of the same package of the same dependency. And 
Like if you did, if you weren't really good at Linux, that was hard to deal with. Like so, in two thousand three, I did or two thousand four, I did a, a year of Linux on the desktop at work. Like I replaced Windows on my work machine with Linux, and I lived with it for a year. And I started out with Mandrake, which was what somebody who I thought was an expert recommended. And I immediately jacked up the machine to the point that the window manager wouldn't boot, and I couldn't do anything in the graphics, and I couldn't didn't have enough information to fix it. And another person was like, "Hey, try Debian. You're going to like this." And I installed some software that with apt-get, and I was like, this is amazing. This is We're beating around the bush here. The upshot is that for all intents and purposes, Debian invented the app store. Kind of. Kind of, yeah. It's it's like historically very significant. It's also one of the oldest distros. It's from like barely a year or two after the Linux kernel itself debuted is when they started mm-hmm. working on it, I think. And yet still around, still incredibly influential. There are like 8,000 distros over the years derived from it. It's like huge distros. Ubuntu yeah. is derived from yeah. it. Raspbian, which became Raspberry Pi OS, which yeah. is the main OS that runs on Raspberry Pis, is derived from it. And the reason that so many other distros can be derived from Debian is because it's completely open. It's completely unencumbered. And like, yes, all open source is open, you know, to some degree. But like Debian is not corporate in the slightest way. It is 100% community driven. It's 100% built by volunteers. You know, Canonical, as Jonathan will mention in the interview, works on Ubuntu, which is a, you know, Canonical is a company. It is a corporation that makes money. But Debian is not like, you know, something like Fedora that comes out of Red Hat, which is another huge corporation. Debian is just a bunch of people around the world who abide by the Debian social contract, which you'll hear about in the in the interview. And all the code in the official repos is GPL. So it's right. re, you can reuse it freely. Right. We we put a copy of Debian on the Boot Magazine CD in like 1998. Because we didn't, there was no other software that we had to go get clearance on to publish, yeah. to republish ourselves. But there, there are a lot of practical reasons that I use Debian. That's what I run on my main server here at home. But like well, part of what drew me to it is philosophical as well. You know, it's, it's the true and complete openness, the completely community driven nature of it. They've got commitments to making sure it remains completely free and open uh, yeah. in perpetuity. There's a couple of lingo terms that we get into with Jonathan that you need to understand if you aren't familiar with Debian. Uh, we talked about apt and and DP, B, D, he calls it DPKG. I call yeah. it, I've always pronounced it as DPackage, but whatever. Yes, I, I always say it in my head as DPackage. Something I've learned, if you Google how to pronounce the name of something in the Linux world, you will never find agreement on it. So I think, I think you're okay <laughs> to just say whatever you want. Yeah. The other thing is that the Debian release cycle is a little bit slow. And we talk about this a fair amount. There's long-term support versions, LTS versions of Debian, which are certain releases come out and they're supported for a a long and defined period of time. X X number of years after, you know, after they're like not the new version anymore, they say, hey, this will still get security and bug updates for X five years, six years, whatever. And they do this so specifically so that when you build an application or something that requires specific software, you know that you can download the right LTS version of it if you need to rebuild the machine or expand the capabilities or move it onto a new something. It's for people who are building more mission critical software than, you know, say my ad blocking Raspberry Pi in the garage. Yeah. The other thing is the is the different branches. So they have stable testing and SID. Stable is the current stable release of the whatever the next the next release uh, the last release I guess. Uh, no, it's it's kind of it's considered the current release. Uh, okay, but it but it's static. We talk about this in the episode, but it's when they put out a stable release, everything in it has been frozen in terms of the versions of the software in there, and that doesn't change. Like yeah, they will issue security and and, and bug updates, but they will not rev the versions of packages in Debian stable. And that's generally for about two years before the next version comes out. So like there, and he talks about it, there are situations where if you're running stable toward the end of that two years, you're running software that's about two years old, but it's very stable. And that, that's usually a problem more if you're installing a stable version of Debian on a newer hardware that maybe isn't supported fully or something like that. Right. Or, or if you just need some bleeding edge feature in some package you use, you know, but, but there, we, we talked about in the interview, there are ways with, you know, like the backports repo to get newer versions of things if you need to, or you can move up to testing, which is testing is what will become the next stable. Yeah. Basically. So testing is new versions of stuff. It's in active development. It's a little buggy and they will freeze that at some point and it'll become the next stable. And then beyond that, there is SID also known as unstable. You probably don't want to live there unless you're doing actual development work or bug hunting. Yes. Yes. But yeah, that's where they say bleeding edge, I think, often comes up when you're looking at at SID repos. And when you set up your Debian machine, you configure which repos you want to pull from, whether you want to pull from stable or testing or SID. It's it's interesting. It's it's one of the many, many cool things about working with the stuff. I actually 
in prep for this interview, I was like, how do you install Debian Unstable or SID? And the recommended course is to install stable and then just change the repos to the unstable repos and then do a full, you know, dist upgrade. Yeah. And and it'll just convert the machine into unstable. It's it's pretty awesome and flexible like that. It, that is maybe the most terrifying thing I've ever done as a Linux user was when I was b- brand new at Linux and somebody's like, oh, you shouldn't be on stable. Your hardware is too new for stable. You got to you got to roll over to SID. And I was just like, oh, this is scary. None of this is going to work. And then it worked. It was amazing. Those people should just go run Arch. <laughs> that's what they want. <laughs> well, I don't think Arch existed back then. But anyway, so that's it. That's that's Debian. Jonathan's been the project leader. We talk about how he became the project leader and what it's like to run one of the foundational Linux distros in 2023. Uh, so Jonathan, it's going on, I guess, about three years now since you were elected as project leader of Debian. I'm curious, first of all, what were your objectives and goals going into this position? Good question. I have to look up that myself now because it's been so long. I feel like that old lady in Titanic when she says uh, it's been 84 years. (laughs) um, (laughs) So I had a bunch of things I wanted to fix in Debian that I'm still working on fixing. And uh, so maybe I can speak about the Debian voting process a bit. So every year we vote a new Debian project leader and every Debian project leader, it's not like a a manager or a boss of the project. You have have a bunch of functions that allow you to steer the project a bit, but you don't get to make all the decisions or tell people what to do. So every year, a Debian developer who wants to become a Debian project leader can set up a platform where they explain what they want to do, what what they want to achieve within this year that they become Debian project leader. And then all the Debian developers who are project members in the project gets to vote for a new project leader that kind of takes a steering wheel for for one year inside the project. So um, when I was running for DPL, it was very interesting times. It was early in 2020. So that was just as COVID started breaking out and things just became really chaotic and it was a bit difficult to come up with a platform because the world just seemed so uncertain. So part of my goals was to give some reassurance to the project and its members, give some comfort where I can. I also wanted to to grow our community, set up more in-person meetings, make more funds available for people who wanted to, to do outreach. We had lots of people who wanted to go out to school and tell kids about Debian. And um, I just want to make sure funds are available for that. Unfortunately, that just didn't work out at all because of COVID for that year. Um, I also want to promote men- mentorship and local teams, improve onboarding. And so all of that is starting to get better now. But in my first year, those specific things were quite tough. But yeah, that that was what got me involved. I think, let me just see, it, it feels like so long ago. It's amazing how quickly time just uh, uh, flies. But uh, yeah, those were some initial things that... Time. That got me, and I was passionate about Debian. I've been a Debian developer for a few short years at that point, and um, just wanted to do more for the project, and that's what drove me to the position. I'm going to quote from an interview that you did around that time in 2020. The quote is, "Our marketing is a real issue because many people out there have really odd misconceptions about Debian. What what are some of those misconceptions in your mind?" Um. So let me just off the top of my head. I think there's still a perception that we don't release often, that we only release every couple of years. Or I mean, we do literally release every couple of years, but it's not as bad as it used to be around 20 years ago, where Debian would go four or five years without a release. Because since about 2003, I think, it's been quite steady. There's been a new release almost on clockwork every two years. It's maybe drifted by a month here and there. We're aiming to release by about middle of this year. We we don't know if that's possible. Maybe one or two more months will pass if there's really some critical or complicated issue. But so far, things are looking good. So Debian has really gotten really good at uh, releasing every two years. And that's great. Also, even those stables, the software versions in stable are, are static and they stay the same except for some small security updates or major fixes. There's also Debian backports, which is quite useful um, because you can get a large amount of new versions of stuff that you can release, that you can install from there into stable and still get newer versions of software. So um, that's also something that many people don't know about that I think that we should market more. 
but but we don't. <laughs> so I know Debian, you vote on a lot of things as an organization. I'm, I'm curious how, uh, especially a large organization with a lot of contributors like Debian is, how it actually works. You know, do you vote on everything? Is it you voting on the big decisions like when you upgrade to a new kernel? Is it that you know the people who are individually responsible for the packages are kind of responsible for what they for for their small areas of the overall OS, and then you know the the main Debian group decides what gets integrated up into into SID, and then and then the stable releases. That's right. So for most things, we try to keep people as autonomous as possible. So we don't vote on everything. Actually, we have about one to two votes a year. The DPL election being one of them. So if you're a maintainer of the package, you typically have almost absolute say on what happens with that package. And it's up to the package maintainer to upload a new version when it comes available upstream. And typically we try to keep those packages, the latest version, um, as late a version as possible until the freeze for the next release starts to hit. So um, right now we're busy freezing for the Debian 12 called Bookworm release. The, the first of a few freezes are starting now. And then in a few months, we should be releasing the Debian 12 version. So at the moment, you can still upload new versions of packages into uh, Debian. But um, I think in the next month or so, that will freeze to the point where you won't be able to do that anymore. And then we'll know the final versions of uh, um, software that will be available in Bookworm. So some teams had to make difficult decisions. So we have the Python team, for example, and they had to decide whether we ship Python 3.11, which had just released. So that means that once we upload that to Debian now, we also have this huge list of dependencies that will also need to be updated to work with Python 3.11 that puts pressure on additional developers just before freeze. And it, it was a... It was a double-edged sword whether we should do that or not. But the thing, the thing with Python 3.11 is it's so much faster than Python 3.10. And we thought that the end users would be forgiving of a few bugs if they get the latest and fastest and a, a big leap in Python performance. So, um, And we do have still have a few months to fix some bugs and, and rough corners if, if they do occur. So uh, when it comes to decision-making, teams make decisions, individuals make decisions. And uh, if we need to override the package maintainer, then we'd have what's called a general resolution. And there's a whole process for that where you send the email to Debian vote, you'll need seconds, people to second the motion, and then the project secretary will eventually set up a vote where the whole project votes on it. So we have in the past overturned individual developers once or twice, but it's not something that we like doing. It's uncomfortable and unpleasant for everyone. And it it can demotivate that maintainer as well. So it's really a last resort. If something comes to a vote, it's usually uh, not really what we wanted. I'll, I'll preface this by saying I am an, an enthusiastic Debian stable user, um, but stable does have a little bit of a reputation for being kind of, you know, I hate to use the term like old or outdated, but, you know, pack, package versions are kind of set in stone at the time of release or at the time of the freeze. And don't really change for, you know, a couple of years until the next version. Does that create a lot of extra pressure to really get it right? Like you said, with the Python choice, like since you know that people who run stable are kind of going to, this is what they're going to have for the next couple of years. Is that, does that create extra tension in the decision-making process and, and urgency when you're trying to lock those versions in? It, it does because there's at the moment, there's lots of pressure on everyone to get their packages up to date to the latest upstream versions. And there's, there's some packages, for example, um, Toot is one of them that interacts with upstream software like uh, Pleroma and Mastodon, where you can post your status updates. And because API changes upstream a lot, the client side also needs quite a bit of updates. So I'm pretty good at updating that package. If there's a new upstream version, typically within 24 hours to, to three or four days, the new version will be in Debian. But often... A day or two later after one release happens, I get emails already saying, hey, can you please update Toot? I want this latest version. I want to fix one of my bugs. And there's a few of those. And, and I think many Debian developers just get overwhelmed with emails asking, can you please get this updated now before freeze happens? And uh, there, there is definitely some some pressure there. How, how many developers are we talking about these days? How many people, How many active contributors are there for, to Debian? Do you, do you even know? Yes, um, but it also depends on your definition of active. So we have what we call the missing in action team in Debian. They look at people who haven't contributed in any way in Debian and basically ping them and ask them, hey, are you still there? Are you still alive? 
are you still involved in Debian? Because we, we have a bunch of, there's a site called contributors.debian.org that checks whether people files bugs or contributes to the wiki or mailing lists. And we have some methods to check whether someone is um, active or not. But our definition of active is quite broad. So if you file a bug or post to a mailing list, you can still be marked as active. So that doesn't mean you're a huge contributor. It just means you're... We, we we it means we've seen you, and we know that you're still active in some level um, um, inside the project. So on that level of of active, it's in the thousands. So we have a we have about almost a thousand Debian developers. Those are people who are members of the project. They have voting rights, and then we have even more people who just casually contribute. So um, they might add a patch to a bug every few months, or some of them uploads packages every week. It differs quite largely. But if we come to the core amount of Debian developers, people who contribute very actively on, on almost a daily basis, I would, at the thumb suck, I would guess that's about 300 or 400 people. Okay. okay. And everybody's volunteers, right? That's right. That's amazing. Some people can't test that a little bit too, because obviously some people are employed and they work on Debian um, on their employer's time. But from a Debian perspective, they're all volunteers we don't pay anyone to contribute to debian um, although lots of people do oh, do it I, as part of their day job i promise i'm not having delusions of grandeur here but since you mentioned kind of filing bug reports i i filed a bug report on the kernel package about three weeks ago that was accepted and i, I think they're gonna make make the the flag change in the next in the next version like what what category does that put me in in, in your eyes in terms of like i'm certainly no developer you know i'm not packaging software myself but like for people who are kind of like users that kind of stick their fingers into the process a little bit? Like what level of sort of... Um, that's not even in my view. That's a, a formal definition. So in Debian, we call that a Debian contributor. So your 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 role would be a Debian contributor. And we, we hope that's that <laughs> Debian contributors eventually become Debian developers. It doesn't always happen, but yeah. uh, we value all contributions. Sure. And uh, if someone makes a few casual contributions ever, then that's also valuable. And anything you contribute will, will affect maybe... Anything from one to dozens to thousands to maybe hundreds of thousands of users out there. So uh, every small contribution matters. I feel, I feel very special right now. <laughs> so time to update that business card, Brad. I guess so. It's funny. In 2003, I was a magazine journalist, and I did a. I spent a year ditching Windows and using Linux on the desktop. And Debian was the version of Linux that I chose after doing a fair amount of research. And at that time, the idea of a central software repository where you could just type a command and it would search for and then install the software you wanted was really, really remarkable. Like that was a novel concept, not just in Linux world, but also in the commercial software world too. Do you think that people who grow up now, you know, who've had app stores and their entire life can even appreciate that as a, as a concept that, hey, there can be a place where you just go to get the software you need. It's conceptually fascinating to me. It is, yeah, I think so too. I also started using, well, that was also the year I started migrating from Windows XP to using Linux full-time, 2003. Um, but yeah, De Debian almost single-handedly invented the App Store or the App Store concept over the 90s. And I, I do think that it, 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 it will be less impressive to, to younger people today, but I still meet lots of young people who are enthusiastic about the idea that there's uh, you know, a single repository for all the open source code that exists out there that they can easily get and install, and and they still get excited about it. So maybe they won't have the historical appreciation as much as we do, but they're still enthusiastic about it and and eager to get involved. So uh, um, I still have hope for the for the younger generation. <laughs> to me, that was the thing that separated Debian from from everyone else, and that was the thing that kind of that began to make. They made Linux a more manageable piece of software for a lot of people, and I think that's one of the reasons we've seen so many kind of follow-on projects that have uh, that are built on top of Debian. Is I also find it amazing because if you look at Debian's history, it started with a vision of what Debian should be, but for years Debian wasn't anywhere close to that vision. So, I mean, Debian the Debian project started in 1993, and DPKG only came along in 1995. So. For two years, Debian didn't even have DPKG. Would, would, would we even recognize that as a Debian system now? And Apt only came along in 1999. So for a large part of the 90s, Debian didn't even have Apt. That's almost kind of mind-blowing. <laughs> 
people used to just wget.dev files and dpkg minus i dem on a system. And it, it seems so crude by, to, by today's standards, but that was enough to excite people and get them involved and got the cycle of improvements going that led to the systems we have today. You're not wrong that that does sound kind of quaint in a modern context, but thinking back to that time, like that, that was revolutionary at that time because like my first exposure to Linux was somewhere around 97, 98 when I, I tried to install Slackware and fumbled around for about two afternoons and then went screaming back to Windows. But even at that time, Debian already had a nascent package, man, as you say, you know, well before that. PKG was already kind of coming online. Like I, j I just, I think back to like how different would my life be if I had discovered Debian on Usenet rather than Slackware at that time, right? Like you were already, even, even in those early days, you were already kind of making things more usable and more approachable in terms of software than kind of everything else that was out there in the Linux world. The two year release cycle means that by nature, it's kind of a little bit a little bit more conservative, right? It feels like a, a safer option for those things that you want to maintain stable. So like whether it's a server or, or something like that, it doesn't feel like the place I would go for like a desktop. Now, even with backports and knowledge of that, do you feel like that's a, do you think that's a strength of Debian or you think that's a, a challenge that's facing you with it in terms of adoption? I think it's both because users will tend to want the latest and greatest versions of upstream software. And usually at this time of a, of a cycle, we feel it. Like uh, in my day job, we have lots of students, they're university students, and they all use Debian in our organization. And usually at this cycle, we start to feel that the library, we, we get lots of requests from the students because we have an own repository where we upload some uh, science software and uh, newer versions of some libraries. And at this point, we, we start feeling that they want newer software and also the hardware that they get starts to become too new for, for the current stable release. So we start to include more things from backports for them, like Xorg and a newer kernel as well, so that they, all the hardware can work properly. So usually at this this stage in the in the release cycle, we do feel it. So it's, it's almost like two years is just barely, barely too long. <laughs> Maybe what, what one and three quarter years would even be better. But for the most part, it does work. Um, stable releases is definitely probably the biggest cause of, of tension and additional work in Debian, because if we, if we didn't have stable releases, more than half our work that we have to deal with would, would disappear because it takes so much work, firstly, to freeze a release, to, to test things, to fix bugs for stable release. Security bugs are a, a huge amount of work. Um, if you've ever done a security um, upload for Debian, you'd know all the, all the paperwork you have to go through and prove that you won't break user systems by uploading that security upload. It, it's it's just so much work. Even a one line change or a one byte change in a package can be a lot of work and testing. And if, if we didn't have to do that, it would be so much easier. But then on the flip side, having stable releases that have security um, updates for three years plus LTS takes that up to five years. And I think you can buy more from Frixion. That means that large organizations can deploy it and, and use it, which, I mean, without that, Debian would be a lot less useful. So, I mean, then you could almost just as well use Arch Linux. Not quite, but that they'd be very close to the same thing. So the stable releases are very important. And uh, even though they're quite a pain for many of us, uh, we do value them. Would you ever recommend that someone, who, you know, the, the theoretical desktop user who wants to live on the bleeding edge, would you ever recommend that they run the testing release? Or does that is that maybe a little too risky for somebody who needs things to work all the time? I think once they've gained a little bit more experience, um, then running testing is a good idea. It also means that they can help find bugs, <laughs> find bugs faster that can be fixed for the rest of the people who are less experienced out there. Because it, it helps being able to... For example, just know how to log in on a on, on a TTY terminal screen and do something like type dpkg minus minus configure minus a if some upgrade went wrong or or just an apt minus f install. Because on, on testing, you'd be it's more likely that some upgrade might go a little bit skew and you might just need to type one line or two to get things going again. So far, I've been running unstable on my laptop since. Since forever, I can't even remember when it's it's it, it's many years now, and there's only been twice I think that I had to do something like that to to get my desktop back running again. But 
it, it just has to happen once for someone who doesn't know Linux very well or Debian very well and it could ruin their day or their week or get them stuck and they can't do their work and it would be a very bad experience. So I tend to recommend stable and then later on, once they get the hang of it, then the testing becomes a lot more fun. There's a moment when you do that, when you mess up X or you mess up your graphical interface and, you're and it's your main computer, there's a real moment of fear that stri strikes in your heart. And the first time you do it, it's, I mean, it's, it's the moment that you decide if you're going to be a Linux user on the, on the desktop for a long time, I think. Since you mentioned the, the support cycle for stable releases, you know, three years, I think five for LTS and so forth. Are you aware of any, any major corporations that rely extensively on Debian? Um, there's a lot. Um, off the top of my head, there's Google, but Google uses testing internally, so <laughs> they're not so much a consumer of Debian Stable, but there's many, and somehow I can't think of one off the top of my head. I can look at Debcon sponsors because there's uh, quite a few there. Um, oh, I shouldn't be typing while I'm talking, but... <laughs> But yeah, there's there's many that's that's using Debian. Uh, like Rush is one of our sponsors. They use Debian quite have extensively internally. And yeah, there's there's many of them. We we, we hear from them when things go wrong. <laughs> What's nice is that many of the big companies out there that use Debian, they have people that get involved in Debian. So when we go to DebConf, our annual conference every year, we meet lots of people from different organizations who want to get involved in Debian and um, eventually even do. So, uh, yeah, that's great. But in the last while, we've got some people from um, Lenovo and Western Digital also getting along. So that's been fun because now when we get, when we encounter bugs, we can actually forward it and someone inside of those companies can actually do something about it. Debian is also unique in, for people who are only familiar with commercial software, it's it's unusual that Debian has formed the foundation of a ton of other Linux distros at this point. It, it may be unusual to them. It, I think it's not unusual in in, in Linux world. But you, you know, there's actually a statement that says Debian welcomes and encourages organizations that want to develop new distributions based on Debian. And and I wonder how much of that. Like, do you have a sense of of why that is? Why people like Debian building off of Debian so much? Um. Yes, that's quite a big question. Um. I think it's something that we want to, as we want people to build on Debian and because we, we can't be everything. We're just too small in terms of our active developer base. It's impossible for us to be everything to everyone. So we like the idea that people can take Debian and make it their own and customize it to their needs and pass it onto their clients or to their actual end users. And often that means that they end up contributing some of that back to Debian, which is really useful. Like our biggest spin-off, like Ubuntu, they contribute a lot back to, to Debian. They've even done big, complicated transitions in Ubuntu. And, and then once that have, that's has completed, they they started the same transition, um, minus all the bugs that they fixed back to Debian. So Ubuntu has done a lot for Debian, and that, that's been a beneficial relationship. And we've had a bunch of different ones like that. And uh, the other big difference with Debian is that we don't have any license or any, we don't have any roadblock for people basing their products on Debian. You can base your product in Debian without getting in touch with us, without getting any sort of special permission. With Ubuntu, for example, you do need to get permission from Canonical before you base your product on um, Ubuntu and, and pay them some fee for that. But Debian has nothing like that. So it makes it easy to base things on, on Debian. Is the ease of access I mean, I, part of that's due to licensing, I know, because your mainline repository is just all, it's all open source. There's no, there's no closed source code in there, right? That's right. At least we tried. There's been a few, I think, well, maybe a handful of bugs over the years where something slips in because maybe um, upstream says all their code is GPL and it turns out they included one image in the that ends up being property of someone and it's got, it's it's non-free and it shouldn't have been there. But then we swiftly remove it again and it gets fixed. So I, th I, I do think that helps that organizations know they can install things from main and distribute it without having to do big intensive audits because our FTP team have done that when the package was accepted in Debian in the first place. So that's a, it's a strength in that regard, but then the commitment to open source is also sometimes a challenge too, because right, it means you have like driver issues and things like that. Uh, I mean, less so now, I think in the, in the modern age, in the old days, closed source drivers versus open source drivers was always an issue, as I recall. 
Oh, yes. So webcams are just becoming so much more complicated. They send all kinds of raw data to the computer, and it's it's not as simple as a, a video stream anymore. And all these drivers and things that it takes to get this video stream out of all that raw data, it's all proprietary now. So it just makes it so much more difficult to, to get webcams working on Linux than it used to be. That's one part. Then you get uh, stuff like NVIDIA's new cards. In old days, you had a driver that ran on your computer that talked directly to the card. And I mean, the, the closed source NVIDIA driver was already a beast before. But how it works now is you have more like an API running on a Linux side. It makes it very easy to create a driver. And the new NVIDIA driver, which isn't really a driver, is now open source. And how that works is the actual driver runs on the card. So you have an extra CPU, a RISC-V CPU on the NVIDIA card, and the driver actually runs there. And from the Linux side, it's just a bunch of GL commands and stuff that you send over an API to the driver that runs on the card. So that means if you want to fix a bug or even want to write an open source driver for that card, it becomes nearly impossible. It's a new set of challenges because in one way, it's really easy for us to provide a driver for that card. We just have a blob that we get from NVIDIA that we upload to the card and initialize the, the user space API and it just works. So it, it looks great from the user side, but from a software freedom perspective, it's actually getting a lot worse and there's not much we can do about yeah, it. Yeah, it's it's an interesting tension with Debian having, you know, I guess what I would kind of describe as like an ideological commitment to free and open software. Because for, for example, like I... I I'm a, a staunch ZFS user, um, and ZFS is open source, but not even not just just under a different type of somewhat incompatible license. And so every time you go to every time you go to build the kernel modules for ZFS, you get a giant splash screen that pops up before you can start the build that essentially just says, "Hey, attention! This software is under a different license that is not compatible with the GPL." And like, you know, you just hit enter and move on. But I always get this little twinge of like, am I doing something wrong right now? <laughs> you know, but it, it's interesting that the organization has still maintained this commitment to, you know, you can opt into these things, but out of the box, it is still a very, I guess, quote unquote, pure experience from a free software standpoint. It, I've always found it interesting that people think of it as an ideological approach, because from our perspective, it's more a, a practical uh, approach. Um, so in the case of, of ZFS, for example, that, that that message is exactly for the type of people who would want to, um, you know, build a system, integrate everything together, and then pass it on to their clients. So in that case, you can't make CDDL and GPL code and redistribute it. And if you do it on your own computer, it's hundred percent fine. No one has any problem with it. But in my personal opinion, I think it would be nice if we explain that in that specific dialogue because users are a bit confused about it. And like you say, they do get a sense that, am I doing something wrong here? Am I allowed to do this? Is this fine? And it is actually completely fine. But maybe a message of um, a better, or at least a link to an explanation that gives some more details would be nice on that page. I'll make a note of that. If you'd like some help writing human readable license language, give us a call. We're, <laughs> we're available. We're always available. You know, that business explanation you just gave is actually very instructive, just kind of from a pragmatic standpoint, you know, it's like that there is a business case for not mixing these types of software together. And that that does help illustrate why those kinds of warnings are there and in a way that I think almost anybody can understand. I often think about a big open source project like Debian as a self-organizing organism, but I, I think that's a little bit unfair to you and, and the folks that organize, that, that run the organization of Debian. But but you do have a well-defined set of rules that are now more than 20 years old, I guess, that kind of define how the project works. And, and I'm curious how much of your job as the DPL do you feel is maintaining that and, and keeping that up to date and moving forward and putting the organization in a place where it can adapt and, and grow and remain relevant? Or you know, how much of your job is on the day-to-day -day is just you know writing code and you know checking in code and, and validating commits and helping people with their challenges? So the DPL role, you get you have one very big power in Debian, and that is that you can set up delegations. So you can give other people almost any power that you can imagine in Debian. So that, that's a delegation that the DPL can set up. So the DPL itself doesn't have so much power, but you can give power to other people. So we have lots of delegations within Debian that the, that the DPL has um, allotted. So 
Um, for example, when it comes to things like policy, we have a Debian policy team who maintains our actual packaging policy. That's over 200 pages of how you should maintain packages and how you should deal with certain situations in packages and how you should work with libraries and upgrades and how to maintain the script should work. And um, every few months, there's a new version of this Debian policy guide and it, it's version so that you can even tag in your package which policy version um, it last adhered to so that when you do upload your package again, you can compare that standards version, that policy version to the new policy version. And um, inside the policy manual itself, there's a change log that you can follow to to get your package from one version to the next to to keep it compliant. So there's a whole team working on that, which is great, which means that the DPL doesn't have to worry about little things on that detail. We also have um, the DevConf committee. They are a team that makes sure that our annual conference happens every year. They do things like make sure that um, we have a venue, that we have a team behind it, that um, the, the website goes up, that registrations happen. And there's all these different teams that exist. There's one that maintains all the accounts in Debian. So when you become a new Debian developer, they make sure that you get your email address and can log into servers and all of those kind of stuff. So there's, we, have, we have our Debian system administrators who take care of all our infrastructure. So um, we're very strongly and, and team-based and uh, from the DPL's perspective on, on creating delegations for that. A, a new one that helped me a lot was um, a community team. This was actually a, a delegation that was set up by the previous DPL uh, the year before I became DPL. And I've been so thankful for that because they catch... They get so much community issues and interpersonal issues. And if I had to deal with all of that, it would have been a huge strain on me. So, so um, yeah, I'm very thankful for that specific one to have happened just before I became DPL. But, yeah, uh, teams and delegations play a huge role in the day-to-day -day running of Debian and keeping things changing. So you mentioned that nobody is earning a living from the Debian organization directly, that it's all essentially volunteer driven. Um, this one of the things we're interested in on this podcast is how people essentially doing a ton of very intense volunteer work also support themselves. Do you have a sense of kind of what the predominant means of earning a living is among Debian contributors? Or maybe to put it another way, I mean, is it safe to assume that most of the contributors are just doing a ton of work in their free time to keep all of this going? Is that is that kind of how it shakes out for most people? It varies quite a lot. We I think typically it's people who's who has a day job and their employer are fine with them contributing to Debian on work time, probably because it benefits the employer as well, or maybe the employer is enthusiastic about Debian. I think that's typical. Then on the on the outliers, we have people who don't work for various reasons, and maybe they're students, maybe they're on some disability grant, maybe they're just rich. We have a bunch of people who just have lots of money, and it just happens to be what they like doing. And uh, there's, there, there's a big range of different Debian developers and what motivates them to contribute to Debian. So, uh, so yeah, it, it varies a lot. Um, it's, it's amazing seeing these wide range of different people at, at the DebConf conference every year. And in, in normal life, many of these people would never be, be together in one room um, outside of this. But yet in, in Debian, we're kind of all equal. And yeah, it's like an, 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 a nice level playing field for people to talk and share ideas and um, contribute together. We, we do get quite a bunch of donations within Debian from commercial companies and also individuals as well. And we have been thinking of ways to have some form of small grants for people who want to work on something specific. So uh, that, that's not set up at all yet. We're not, we haven't done much work on it yet. But the, the idea is there that at some point we set up some method to, to pay people for little bits of work that they want to do, especially things that no one else wants to do. So if you look at the LTS project, for example, they specifically get donations just to allocate to LTS because LTS isn't something that someone typically wants to volunteer for. So if you don't pay for them, then LTS just doesn't happen. And there might be some other areas in Debian like that too, that if we made grants available, then maybe more people would be um, 
willing to contribute to those areas. I think providing grants to people who aren't you know, independently wealthy or funded by their employer is is an important diversity and inclusion thing as well, right? It's it's a it's a different. I mean, I, I my understanding is that right now Debian contributors are predominantly white men, as is a lot of common in a lot of the open source world, and and I know that's the thing that you're you're actively working on, and I'm curious how you how you're approaching diversity and inclusion. Yeah, so currently we do participate in an outreachy project. But that's usually two interns working for a few months at a time on Debian. Some of them stick around, some of them move on. It's a little bit of a gamble and it's expensive, but we're willing to do that because we don't have um, much other internal outreach projects yet. We would like to initiate more of our own projects, especially um, that allows us to to do more things in schools. And we actually want to reboot the outreach team soon and allow them to, to do things like that. But that's hopefully coming up in the next few months. But yeah, also at DevCon, we have a budget available for, for diversity. So we, we tend to invite people who have increased diversity and also there's bursaries available that people can, can apply for. And typically we bump that budget every year to get a few more people in as well. But it's it's difficult because the pool, the pool of people out there who want to contribute to Debian, they are, as you say, mostly white male um, mostly from Europe and the US. So uh, it is difficult increasing diversity, but it is something we're working on and, and want to do um, because there's value in that. And it, it is interesting in, in India, our contributors there tell us that computer science is more of a women's, it's considered more of a women's role. So there's much more women in computer science in India than typically in the rest of the world. So yeah, that's quite interesting. And we are getting more women contributors from India in the last few years. I wanted to dovetail with Will's question and, and mention the, the Debian social contract, which is something that I, I found appealing when I started using Debian. It's also the reason I used the term ideological earlier, because it does read as kind of a, you know, almost manifesto-esque kind of mission statement. But it's it's very focused on maintaining, you know, the free software aspect of Debian and making sure that, you know, it's it remains 100% free and that it constantly is giving back to the open source community and so forth. Uh, have you have you thought about merging more kind of broader social themes into that contract in the context of of kind of diversity and inclusion and making those more kind of a visible part of the the mission statement for the distro? We do have a diversity statement. It's not part of the social contract, but it's part of the policies just as much as the social contract is. So um, if you go to debian.org slash intro slash diversity, you'll find that our diversity statement says that we welcome and encourage participation by everyone, no matter how you identify yourself or how others perceive you. And we, we welcome contributions from anyone as long as they interact with our community constructively. So... Um, yeah, even though our, our project is technical in nature, we value and encourage contributions from those with expertise in in those areas and other areas and welcome them into our community. So it's, it's just two paragraphs that basically say, say that, you know, as long as you behave yourself and work well with others, we welcome you. One other one other kind of silly question or, or just something I wanted to mention about your your kind of contributor distribution. You have a map on, on Debian.org, I guess, that people can... I, th I think contributors themselves are entering kind of coordinates for their location. You have at least one contributor in Ant Antarctica. I don't know if, are you familiar with? That's probably Tux. That's my best guess. <laughs> I actually don't know who that is. That's interesting. I'll, I'll have to go look at, I think I can actually look that up in the Debian uh, uh, members database. We have a database where you can look up people. So out of curiosity, I'll go check, but I have no idea who that is offhand. That's funny. They have a lot of time to kill in McKinley Station. So somebody, somebody is doing some coding. I, I was just say the other the other thing that's notable is that Debian is De Debian is the official OS of the space station, right? It is. They use it on a space station. I'm not sure if it has like a moniker, like official system of a space station. They use Debian both on the ground and in the space station. So, uh, but not exclusively on either. It's it's one of the systems they use. We haven't heard much about NASA, so we know that they use Debian, but we haven't interacted much with them yet. So I'm also curious, uh, more curious about how they use Debian everywhere and 
if someone from NASA happens to be listening at some point to this one day, uh, it would be nice if you can reach out and chat a bit so that uh, we can all learn a bit yeah. more about how it's used there. Sometimes NASA is a little cagey about how the, how they use your software. I know that um, I, when we had um, the curl maintainer on, he said he knew that his code was used on the the drone helicopter that's on Mars right now, but they wouldn't tell him how how it was used because it's all classified because sometimes sometimes space stuff is classified or something. One of the things we, we like to ask about is like your, your origin story and how you got started using Linux, Jonathan. I don't know where to start because it's it's so intermingled, but I'll start in about 1998 when I bought a computer magazine with BOS on the cover disk. And I installed BOS and I was just blown away at how fast it was, how reactive the UI was, even when the computer was busy. I was convinced BOS is the future and it will kill Windows within a few years. And I told all my future, all my friends, use BOS, it's the future, it's going to rule. And I think it was about a week later that I switched on a TV and it was on CNN. And I think they said something about Palm OS buying out BOS. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. But then I just killed it. It, it just never went anywhere after that. So I was completely wrong. What well, one of my tech predictions that was um, quite a big failure, but it was a long time ago. And then someone told me, oh, but you know what? You should really take a look at Linux. That's more like the feature. It's 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 open source. You can check under the hood on what's going on. It's constantly improving. It's very exciting. And um, at that point, I installed, I think, Red Hat 5 on my machine. And I was just so unimpressed with this garbage. Uh, it was like my modem <laughs> didn't work, my display card didn't work. It was completely the opposite of my experience with BOS. And I, I said, no, I'm not going to use this Linux stuff. It's a waste of my time. <laughs> and then later on, when I, I think was it Red Hat six or seven, one of those when one of those were released, I installed it again on my computer, and suddenly my modem worked, my display card worked. My sound card worked, I could play videos, I could connect to the internet. It was mind-blowing the progress that was made in such a short time on my same hardware. And I, it was just really amazing. I didn't switch from Windows yet, but at least at that point, I, at that point it was enough to convince me that there's some momentum behind it and improvements and people are actively working on, on making this better. And then in, I think in 2003, early 2003 or late 2002, I installed uh, Red Hat Linux 7.2. This was before Linux in Enterprise. So this was the old Red Hat Linux 7.2, not, not the Enterprise. And um, yeah. everything worked so well on there. I think this was one of the first versions where they included Evolution by default. So um, that was also quite great for me how much it looked like Outlook. And I could actually start using my email from Linux. I think this was before Thunderbird was available. Um, so at that point, I switched from Windows XP to Linux full-time and got really excited about it. And I, at that point, I was playing with Samba and with Apache and learning how all the various service, services on Linux work. And I thought, wow, someone should really go to schools and start computer clubs and teaching this to kids in schools. And I was very enthusiastic about this. So I kept posting about this to my local Linux user group and other groups in the area. And then I got in touch with, uh, by the Linux user group, with the Shuttleworth Foundation. They're a nonprofit organization founded by Mark Shuttleworth that worked locally here. And they were just starting out a project to get Linux computers into schools. So the, the project was called Tux Labs. And they were getting uh, ref refurbished computers from organizations and then turning them into thin clients and installing them into schools. So at this point, I started volunteering for that project and later worked on full time. I first became a contractor for Shuttleware Foundation and then I worked full time there. So at, at this point, when I started working at Shuttleware Foundation, my, my manager said, you should really start using Debian and you can become a Debian contributor and you can get like, my, my nickname is iVoltage. And I think at the time my email address was something like iVoltage at the pub.co.za. And my boss said, you could get iVoltage at Debian.org. You should really do this. And <laughs> I was like, the, the, the idea of becoming a Debian developer by the, at that stage was so far-fetched to me. I never thought it would even happen or that I could become a Debian contributor. And then uh, um, the, the one day my, my manager, his name was Thomas, he came in and said, hey, Mark is planning on doing uh, 
uh, support for Debian Unstable is going to call it Ubuntu and uh, um, is starting working on that next year. So this was in 2003, a year before Ubuntu came out. So um, later that year, Mark had all the Debian developers he wanted to hire come down to Cape Town and they were at the Shuttle Foundation the one day and I was just so intimidated with um, by the Debian developers, I couldn't even go up and speak to them. It was like, and um, Th Thomas kept telling me, go to them, say hi, say hello, introduce yourself. And I just couldn't, I didn't speak to any of them in the end. It was just too much for me. But at, at that point, I tried out Debian and I was also not very impressed with it. Uh, at that point, I used uh, OpenSUSE for quite a while, what was just called SUSE back then, uh, because I was still on dial up and it came on five CDs and it was just so convenient having all the packages available on disk and uh, being able to easily install offline. But uh, then he told me, no, 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 you're using Debian wrong. You should use you should use testing. That's that's the right one to use. Well, it might have been unstable. I can't remember. But when I switched to Debian Unstable, it changed everything for me. I, I completely got got hooked because I would do an apt um, upgrade, and suddenly I had the same versions of the software I was reading on uh, in my RSS feed um, earlier that morning, and it was just mind blowing having access to such a large uh, repository of software and having it so much up to date. So that's when I got to, to Debian and later on to Ubuntu 2 when that was released. And things just grew from there. So from Shuttle Foundation, I, I went on working for a company called MP Linux. They were a local Linux company doing support for the government mostly. So I did lots of public sector work with Linux there, migrating government computers to Linux and all the weird issues that came with like their app doesn't work because we don't have ActiveX in our web browser and <laughs> lots of complications there. And from there, I worked in Canada for three years and deployed Linux in schools in Canada and the US. And that was lots of fun because it was working in schools again. And yeah, after that, I came back to South Africa and worked for university almost exclusively since then. So, and, and I had my own company that I run on the site. So I have lots of, that's a nutshell of uh, lots of different things that I've been doing with, I've worked in many interesting mining industry, yeah, using Linux in lots of different cases. And it's, it's interesting seeing how people use it everywhere and uh, all the interesting different workflows that exist out there. And uh, Jonathan, if we, if we ever do, so I started my first job working as a journalist was at Ars Technica covering BOS in 1998. So if, if we ever start my, my dream project, which is a BOS fan podcast. Yeah, Jonathan, I actually wanted to ask, uh, have you checked out Haiku, the kind of fan continuation of, of BOS? But, I, I have, especially because yeah. I've been such a BOS fan <laughs> in the right, old days. Right. Um, but uh, it's it's interesting looking at it from a new perspective now that I also understand a lot more about operating systems and how they work. And um, the, this time I was more disappointed by it because it's a single user operating system. So basically everything runs as root. So it's not something you'd want to run on a server and run Apache and a database. It, it will get hacked so quickly um, if you actually use that in in production it's a fun system to play with i'm glad people are working on it and it, it will probably advance and get better with age as well i think alternative operating systems are important um if you look at linux it's becoming it's becoming more and more commercial the if you look at linux foundation they're basically a trade organization that works to meet the needs of all the big corporations that fund them and it, sometimes it feels like the, the little person who's just a, a Debian user or a Ubuntu user or whichever distribution, their interests are more going onto the sideline. And, and it might be fine. And I think Linux will be a fine system for many people for a long time to come. But I kind of like the idea that there's backup uh, systems like, uh, you know, De Debian had a Debian system with a free BSD kernel for a while. Yes. And I kind of like that there's a, a, a little bit of a backup um, available just in case things don't go so well with Linux at some point. Maybe it's 20 years from now or 50 years from now. Um, it's nice that there is some something that can be picked up and improved for to to become a next next decent option if, if needed. What's your daily driver look like these days, Jonathan? Um, I want to run Debian stable, but it usually lasts about a week and then I'm back on all the way up to unstable again. 
and I enjoy running unstable, not only for the new software, but it also helps me find new bugs so that uh, I can fix things for my users before it gets to them. I also use ZFS quite extensively. I use it, I use it on my laptop, my desktop, pretty much on everything. Um, the killer feature for me is just being able to do ZFS send and receive. Uh, it just makes backups so brain dead easy and simple. And at least I know if I see the snap sign sync on both sides, I trust that my data is the same on both sides. There's just so many backup systems that exist out there and it's difficult to verify the actual status on your backups and you don't want to test them the day you have to do a restore. So um, yes, yeah, CFS is... is uh, is a, is a huge important part of my life. So you said you you run unstable usually. How often do you um, update? Are you always on the daily? Uh, typically daily. Now and again, okay. a few days okay. go by where I forget to update or I'm super eager and I update two or three times a day. It also depends what I'm busy doing. Sometimes I'm if I'm at a conference or doing something important where I don't want my computer to break, I just pause it for a little bit. Or sometimes I YOLO it and do a desk upgrade 10 minutes before a talk. <laughs> <laughs> it varies, but, but quite often. Do you have favorite, are there applications that are really speaking to you right now? Like, do you have a favorite notes app? What kind of environments do you work in when you're writing code and stuff like that? Um, I like Terminator, the, the terminal emulator. I've tried a few ones over the years, but that one sticks with me. I'm curious to, to hear what you use as well, but uh, that's by far my favorite terminal emulator. TMAX is quite important to me for managing, especially for remote terminals. I, I use Vim for text editor. I never got into Emacs. I'd like to learn how to use it someday. It's just, uh, there's just not enough time to learn every tool and every text editor that exists out there. But at, at some point I'd like to. Thunderbird is my email client. I use, I like OBS a lot. I had a video channel on YouTube. I, I just had, didn't have time for that in, in, in recent years. For OBS, I do stuff for DevConf too. Like we have this uh, thing called Loopy that runs between talks that shows clips from people who send in their videos and the, the schedule. And it's this big automated thing that pokes OBS and drives it from the back. Th that's a lot of fun. Um, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, I like Gimp, Krita. Uh, I use Alex C for containers a lot. It, it's really great. Yeah, it's, cool. it's it, it should be an easy question to answer, but it's not something I think about a lot. <laughs> um, you've, you've, I, I have to say, you've got about a fifty percent hit rate on the stuff you just rattled off that I also use extensively. <laughs> so you're really speaking my language. Another app that I use like uh, all the time is LightRead for reading feeds. I know um, RSS is kind of taking a backseat these days now that people aren't using Google Reader anymore. Uh, or since they Google killed off that, but I still find it very useful and uh, a good way to keep up with the world. I feel like the kind of Im current implosion of Twitter is driving people back toward less de decentralized things, like whether it's Fediverse stuff or RSS or whatever. So may maybe Google Reader will rise again or something better, hopefully. Hopefully. Have I told you, or are you aware of a Debian social product project since we're on, on going towards that topic? No, let's, let's talk about it. Okay. We have Debian Social. It's a project that I started with two or three other people. Our goal is just basically to get some Fediverse services running for Debian. So we have peertube.debian.social. Uh, this is our own uh, uh, Peertube instance. So we have all the DevCon videos on there, and we want to encourage Debian contributors to make their own Debian videos and upload it to there so that there's some free source where people can browse Debian videos and, and find them. We have dot Debian.social, this is like a Mastodon client that uh, that's hosted by Debian. So if you want a, a, a Debian-hosted Fediverse instance, that's where you can access it from. And we have a few others that we want to play with too. On a Debian wiki page, there's a, there's a wiki page called Debian Social where we list the different services that we host and want to host. There's one that's basically a meetup.com clone. And uh, that sounds like it could be really useful for organizing Debian meetings. So that's one we would like to try out as well. How about desktop environment? I know there's, you know, there's a lot of thought that goes into what the default desktop experience should be for a distro like Debian. Are you, are you going with the defaults that are installed with stable or do you have kind of other, other opinions about what the desktop should be? Personally, I use GNOME. I know it's a very boring uh, choice. Most people I know use more exciting desktops. Lots of people are using Sway these days. 
It's like an i3, but um, it runs on Wayland. Uh, very modern, very slick. But um, I use a few extensions to make GNOME a bit more bearable, and that that, that works ninety nine. That does ninety nine percent of what I want to do. So that keeps me happy. And as for defaults in Debian, our our desktop packages try to keep things as close by to upstream as possible. They actually take pride in giving the experience that upstream intends to give them. So um, we tend to change the wallpaper and maybe a few essential settings, but beyond that. We try not to fiddle with the desktop experience too much. Have you ever been tempted to fork off a Debian variant all your own? I have, um, especially because, I mean, the, see, all the good decisions come with tension behind them as well. So it's really great that you want to provide an upstream uh, pristine experience for desktop, for the desktop environment. But the problem is most defaults aren't always at least for my users, I find that just installing one or two extensions on GNOME makes the world of difference. Uh, if they have a, a panel that's always visible with their favorite applications, it makes it a lot more like Windows or Mac OS, and users just accept it. The, the acceptance rate just goes up a lot. And I've been tempted to just do not, not something as extreme as a whole different distribution, but a Debian spin that just has some good defaults and good default applications installed for that just just an easy Debian. Um, yeah, I've given I've installed Debian for some colleagues, and it's interesting the comments that you get from people. Like my my one colleague was very angry because. Um, Debian doesn't have trace fruit installed by default. And it's it's such an odd thing to me because I mean anything Debian doesn't have, you just have to install it and it's done. But that's enough to to push some people away that it doesn't have some things installed by default. So I think an easy Debian should come with a bunch of things that people typically find useful and expect to find on a on a unique C system and just, just make it easy to install and get going without having to do much configuration or additional setup. Uh, Ubuntu does a good job at that. I'll I'll give that to them. But these days, that also comes with some things that need to be done. Like many users, the first thing they do after installing Ubuntu, for example, is to replace their Firefox snap with a packaged version of Firefox because the snap takes longer to start up. That's frustrating a lot of people. So I'd like it. I'd like to maybe have some a more Ubuntu y kind of Debian where it's easy to install. Get good selection of default software. Less choices for user to make. Make it easier for new user to slide into. I think for experienced users, Debian is just fine. I mean, as long as you know to use apt and you know what you want, it's easy to to get along. But for brand new users, where I was maybe twenty years ago, I think it could be a lot better. It it is really dizzying when you really dig in and start to find the um, the range of minutia that varies between distros. Like I found recently that like Debian ships with the capabilities on the ping binary for for end users to run it, and not just root, but like Arch does not, for example. I mean, it's just like as a as a relatively new user, it's like, hey, why can I ping stuff in Debian and not in Arch? You know, it's there's just so much to understand happening by, under the hood. So last question for me, have you and the community done the math to figure out approximately what year you're going to run out of Toy Story characters? It's going to be a long time. I, with not the math on, on, on an exact date. Fortunately, Pixar slash Disney is really good at releasing new Toy Story movies. It seems like the, the rate that, they, that the release is increasing. So uh, we shouldn't run out of Toy Story characters uh, Anytime soon, because of course uh, Debian um, code names are based on Toy Story characters. So yeah, it, hopefully it's a long time. But then maybe we can switch to something sensible, like just uh, version numbers, like many people have advocated for over the years. Because code names can also be confusing, and especially when you have three in a row that starts with a B. Um, even Debian developers get that. confused between <laughs> those. So uh, someone even complained that the one after Bookworm doesn't start with a B, and it's not confusing enough. <laughs> so after Bookworm, it's Trixie. Yeah. So they said, no, 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 make it another B, please. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah. At least Ubuntu, yeah. they, 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 their releases are alphabetically following each other and they just wrap around from A to Z over and over. So that, that makes it a, a little bit more logical, but uh, sometimes you have to confuse people a little bit. <laughs> I mean, the code names do make it easy to search for you know, release specific issues, though, which is, which is kind of nice. Sometimes version numbers are a little bit more difficult to search for. That is true. So, pros and cons. 
Jonathan, thank you so, so much for coming by and, and chatting with us. If people want to find out more about Debian, they can go to Debian.org, obviously. But where can they find out more about you? Um, good question, because I have a blog that I don't um, update that often. That's something I want to fix. That's JonathanCarter.org. Hopefully, by the time this podcast is published, I'll have a new blog post or two. I, I want to put some more effort into putting out content out there. And yeah, if you want to follow me on the Fediverse, you can follow me on pleroma.debian.social slash high voltage. I certainly learned a lot about Debian today, Brad. I, I learned a lot about myself. Yeah, I, I had no idea this whole time I've been working with a contributor. <laughs> Look, I don't want to I'm not having delusions of grandeur here. I'm telling I, you new business cards. I, I filed one bug, but it was accepted. And apparently that makes me a Debian contributor. <laughs> it's the proudest moment of my life. Congratulations. Uh, but I mean, that's that's kind of the magic of this thing, though. That's what's so awesome about it. Like I use it and enjoy it and it does a lot for me. And then I identified something about it that could be better. And I went to the appropriate people. And in a matter of days, they were like, you know what? Yeah, we'll, we'll do that. Sure, we'll fix that. And like, here we are. And now, now it's going to be even better. You're one of thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people who have worked to fight entropy and make the world a slightly better place. Uh, the, I don't remember if I said it in the interview. The thing I the thing I filed was to enable better support for newer Intel CPUs. And then I got to tell my friend at Intel later, I was like, hey, I got Debian to add support for Alder and Raptor Lake to the kernel. Look at me. Well, but the, the really neat thing about that is the downstream consequences of that are huge because there are a bunch of distros that are built on top of Debian. And like when my Ubuntu server updates in a year or two, it will pick up that kernel patch. And like that is that's amazing. That's the power of open source. It feels awesome. I mean, I, whatever. I, I filed one bug. I ran report bug once and filled it out like it's not like it was a lot of work, but it feels awesome to think in even some small way like, hey, I made a change and it's going to affect a whole lot of people. Hopefully it's in a positive way. Yeah. I mean, now if it's responsible for crashing a spaceship or something like that, that's on YouTube, Brad. So think about that. They probably should not be running the latest kernel out of backports on the spaceship. On the space shuttle. <laughs> but th this was a super gratifying interview for me. I mean, it is something that I'm pretty passionate about and that I spend a lot of time with and get a lot of use out of and benefit from. I mean, it's fantastic. And thanks so much to Jonathan. You can find out more about Debian at Debian.org. Uh, also, a lot of the, the Debian-specific social networking stuff that Jonathan mentioned is kind of wrapped up or, or rolled up, rather, at Debian.social. And I can't remember if he actually mentioned that address in there when he was talking about that stuff. But they're, they're kind of Mastodon equivalents and, and video hosting and a lot of the stuff they use to enable communication in a social media-ish way about Debian is at Debian.social. There's a lot of good community stuff there. As always, this week's FossPod is brought to you by Google Open Source. They bring all of the value of open source to Google and all of the resources of Google to open source. You can find out more at opensource.google. Matt Purdy produced this episode and Sabrina Hill edited it. As always, thank you all so much for listening. We'll be back maybe with a slightly Debian-related episode in a couple of weeks. See you, everybody.